Aboriginal people have lived in Greater Australia for over 50,000 years. They learned every ecological detail of the land, enshrined it in the law, and passed the knowledge on through the generations. When much of the world embraced agriculture, the first Australians rejected it. They chose instead a sophisticated system of fire stick farming and careful management of the land to sustainably increase its bounty. They achieved something unique in human history. They transformed an entire continent into the biggest estate on Earth. By 9,000 years ago, one of humanity's most significant inventions began independently and simultaneously around the planet. Agriculture. In the Fertile Crescent in the Middle East, people started farming with wheat and barley. In China, on the Yellow River, with rice and millet. And in Greater Australia, in the highlands of New Guinea, with bananas, taro and yams. Ru Kundal was a little boy when Australian gold miners entered the hidden Wagi Valley in the 1930s with a film camera. This was the moment when half a million Highlander farmers came into contact with the rest of the world. With stone axes and wooden spades, people had been making drainage ditches and gardens on Rukundal's land at Cook for at least 9,000 years. This would be the same kind of practice which would be employed by people who were making gardens 9,000 years ago in Cook. Uh, they would be using the same kind of implements. They would be uh, employing the same kind of techniques. They would also be getting the same number of people to work on. So you're talking about a society which was organized. The land around Cook was very swampy and had to be drained before planting. As we're going in now, it has all been archaeologically dug up and studied. So we will be walking in the presence of 9,000 years of agriculture. Papa, come here, Miguel. Archaeological excavations revealed the moment people first began exploring a truly revolutionary idea. 
that by transplanting and caring for plants, food would become more reliable. The small round holes in this ancient garden bed once contained posts that supported some of the earliest domesticated plants in history. Microscopic plant residues on stone tools show people were growing what would become three of the world's most important crops. The origin of bananas the origin of taro and also the origin of sugarcane is strongly believed uh, to have evolved around the Wagi Valley in the type of systems which is found here in Cook. By 6,000 years ago, the manipulation of the environment reached massive proportions. Kilometers of interlocking drainage ditches were engineered. They can still be seen crisscrossing the valley beneath rows of modern plantations. The depth of the ditches went from 50 centimeters down to as far as four to five meters. We are talking about massive structures these were among the first large-scale manipulations of the environment in human history. Yet despite the social organization required, the invention of agriculture here didn't lead to city-states as it did in other places around the world. In the highland valleys, communities remained small self-sufficient and respectful of their neighbors' boundaries. It's one of the reasons why New Guinea developed hundreds of languages and cultures. Eight thousand years ago, before agriculture could spread down from New Guinea, rising seas cut it off from the rest of the continent. The hills in between became the islands of Torres Strait. Almost immediately, people came from the south to hunt and gather newly available marine resources. We are uh, at Pulu now, um, at a beach just in front of Pulu, in the front um, area. Okay, I'm on dry. Lying halfway between New Guinea and Australia, the island of Pulu is sacred to Signet and his people. Whoa, I'm going to go to Pulu marks a radical change from the hunting and gathering of the south to more Melanesian ways of using the Torres Strait. Ah, uh, we're here at last. Oh, it's a bit cooler under here. Yes. Hey. The best thing in the house. Oh, it is. <laughs> Yes, this is the, the mask, and this is the reason this cave is called the Mask Cave. And in language, it's called Mawal Sakai. The painting 
is around 2,500 years old. The inner part of the, the mask is the community, and um, the mouth is represented uh, by the initiate for the chieftainship, mm. because that's where the, the laws are coming from. The way that that mouth is depicted, mm -hmm. and particularly the line that comes down from the, the bottom lip, Mm -hmm. down to the bottom of the chin. That's absolutely classic styles that you get in the southern yeah. coast of uh, Papua New Guinea. 2,900 years ago, just before the mask was painted, a wave of seafaring people from the southwest Pacific swept along the southern coast of New Guinea. These were the Lapita people, the future Polynesians, who would go on to colonize remote islands right across the Pacific. They came with ocean-going canoes, new languages, agriculture, and a trademark pottery. This is a piece of the Lapita pottery. This is one of the Lapita sherds. Now you can see those markings there. Markings there. You can see there's actually little impressions yes. that have been pushed in. That's classic Lapita. Yes. This piece of pottery is between, dated between two and a half thousand and two thousand nine hundred years ago. Ooh. Right. And the people who made this are the ancestors of the people who made this piece of pottery here that we found, we dug up right next to you. Okay. So they're coming together again mm. after two and a half thousand years. Yes. Ooh. Mm. Hello, grandfather. From local clays, Signet's ancestors made the first pottery in Australia 2,500 years ago, probably to hold crops for transport. It's not just pottery coming into Torres Strait. The key thing about this is um, you've got the language as well, mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's, it's horticulture and agriculture, yes. because the Lapita people moving along the southern PNG coast mm. grow crops and things like bananas, taro, yes. yams. So horticulture and agriculture came with them? Yes. It's the only way you can have such big population densities on these islands. Yes. Plenty of marine foods, mm. but to get the big population numbers, hundreds and hundreds of people living on these islands, you need something else, and that something else is, is agriculture and horticulture. You've got to grow your crops. Yes. And that changeover is here. We documented it right here in this cave. It was agriculture that underpinned the great seafaring nations of the Torres Strait. For farming to work on small islands, people needed to stay connected. <laughs> And this, this canoe would be, what, between 16 to 20 metres. It's a huge type of a semi-trailer. And the sail would be woven pandanus leaves. Mm. Um, a strip to uh, maybe a centimetre wide strips and then woven again to make it strong, solid, but also flexible to be blown with the, you know, by the wind, yeah. By just looking at the bow, that would put fear into you because you're looking at a face. It's even got like a beard at the front, even got like a, a mouth decorated with uh, shells. I mean, not only are these canoes visually impressive and extraordinary vessels, this is what connected people between islands. When certain islands would sort of get low on water, they would sort of get bamboo tubes and they'd fill them with water and just put tons of water and produce into the lower part of these canoe hulls and move these items between islands and different communities. We wouldn't be exaggerating if we said without these huge canoes, Torres Strait Islander society could not operate.
spear throwers and spears were traded up from Cape York to the Torres Strait, and drums, masts, and bows and arrows were traded back down to Cape York. It's almost like sort of you have highways in the sea. Constant contact and high population densities driven by agriculture led to an active and sometimes violent social network throughout the Torres Strait. We mainly have raids with, um, with more, probably because of some family feud or vendetta that has carried down from descendants to history. Alliances formed enemies identified, and fleets of canoes would go on headhunting raids. It was very popular. This is where they started slicing up the heads. They just cut the skin off and they just twist the oh. head. Oh. The head comes off, yeah. oh. The Marin Anim from southern Papua were especially feared. They would have hundreds of people in these raids, raiding parties that would come in and, and uh, boy, oh boy. You'd just be on a sunny day like this, just looking out over the water, and you can just see the glistening on the, the sun on the water, and it's glistening, glistening. And then all of a sudden on the horizon, you'll notice that one of the little glistens is actually rhythmical. It's pulsating. Because it's the marina nymph. And as they put the paddle in the water and they lift the paddle out, the sun hits the paddle and it goes flash. So, of course, you get this rhythmical flash. People would just go into panic. You hide because these people are brutal. They were the most feared. The heads were required for young boys' initiations. Mm. You had to uh, try and get the name of the person whose head you were liberating from the rest of their body. And then that, that name would be transferred to the young boy. Heads, masks, weapons, tools, canoes, ceremonies, everything was traded, including ideas. Yet there was one idea that was not taken up on the Australian mainland, the very one that underpinned Torres Strait Islanders' society, agriculture. When Aboriginal people saw farming or gardening, they didn't adopt it. On Cape York, they may have tried it some decades, centuries ago, but they gave it up. Uh, given the choice, they preferred the land management system they had. And I think that's true all over Australia. In the rainforests above Cairns, the Mamu Najinji people achieved high population densities, not by introducing and caring for new plants, but by learning how to extract the rich potential from those already there. Yes. Yeah, there's a few here. Oh, there's a couple more there, Richard. No, no. That's not getting heavy for you, Richard, eh? I think you can go. Okay, okay, yeah. All right, well, we'll go down in here and I'll show you another unique tree. Like his ancestors, Ernie Raymond knows every plant in the rainforest. You know? You know, when they're walking about in the field and thirsty, they just bend him over and there you've got a cup. 2,000 years ago, his ancestors learned how to remove the poison from some of the rainforest's most abundant toxic nuts, especially the ganji, or yellow walnut. We just have to look around on the rainforest floor. There's kilos and kilos of, yep. of fruit. This um, yellow walnut, this one here. And within half an hour, one can gather 12, 15, 20 kilos of, of this fruit. And if you've got the right uh, knowledge and technology, uh, one can exploit this very, very easily. 
It took two days to make the nuts safe to eat. First, you had to roast them in a camp oven. And this takes a fairly long while, doesn't it? Yes. As rocks heated. Because there's a lot of energy and effort goes into preparing Oh, this. yes, yes, yes. Because you wouldn't just do it for no. breakfast. No. I remember my grandmother doing it, you know. But uh, tasting it, but oh, I, I couldn't, you know, I didn't like it, but very bitter and tasteless. But the old people liked it. They went crazy for it. You know, it, it was uh, number one food source for our people. The seasonal bounty of these toxic nuts had another huge advantage. They could last up to 12 months when buried in the ground. People stored them, you know, for that special occasion. You know, like when they had tribal meetings and that, you know, they were prepared for it. Mm. So nobody starved in the rainforest because this stuff was already there. When Europeans first came here, there were 12 rainforest groups packed into a very small area, you know, probably the size of maybe Western Victoria. And so that, that really does suggest enough food to support a big population of people. Yeah. And there they are. The nuts were roasted for four hours, making the carbohydrate digestible. So by doing it this way, you're breaking it down, so it might make it easier. And then roll it like the way you're doing it. Grind it. The toxins still had to be removed by leaching in the river for at least 12 hours. Stick it underneath there like yeah, that. like that, yes, Richard. Very good. It has to be steady flowing. Good, yeah. Looks good. 12 hours or more. All in a day's work, eh? <laughs> and in the past, you know, people would uh, eat quite a bit of this. It's only for I buy trial and error that our people got it right. You know, so they just went berserk in the rainforest when these things were dropping. You're right. Because then you provided energy for them. Like at Wallstamp, you've got to be a very intelligent person to live in the rainforest. Processed toxic plants became an important part of the diet in many areas of Australia. It is a widespread phenomenon right down the east coast of Australia, uh, across the top uh, where cycads grow, and in southwest Western Australia as well. People didn't shy away from that. They knew how to deal with these plants. Yeah, no problem. Mm. Mm. Not, not bitter at all, is it? Mm. Mm. This manipulation of available natural food was taken a significant step further by the Gunditjmara of the southeast. They were engineering the entire landscape with the little help from the forces of nature. This is his domain. Bunch of people. Bunch of big men. He brought knowledge. He also brought fear into the hearts of Gunditjmara Shamara peoples. Creator of all things for us. Bajpim erupted 35,000 years ago. It covered the entire landscape with basalt boulders and lava, blocking Dalit Creek. Over tens of thousands of years, the Gundich Mara watched as the rich Lake Conda wetlands grew. They filled with millions of migratory eels and fish. Then the old people with their imagination decided that they would use the rocks for the fish traps, 
and to make sure that they could catch and feed their peoples without any great effort. At least 6,500 years ago, the Gundich Mara began making stone fish traps. They set up a system of permanent aquaculture, eel farming, that sustained thousands of people. The scale of their manipulation of the landscape was breathtaking. There is some serious engineering that's gone on here. And just tons of rock have been pulled out to increase the depth of the channel that they're making. It's been manipulated. Oh, yeah. Naturally, there should be this lava wall here to block off this area from allowing water to get into this low area. But it's been bashed down through here. This is the beginning, the very beginning of the fish traps of Lake Conda. There were dozens of hydraulic systems all around the lake. This one, mapped in the 19th century, was over 350 metres long and shows how the spring rains flooded water and eels through the system. Walking smack in the middle of the channel here. You can see the rocks built up on either side, probably been plucked out of the channel. It's silted up a bit. There's a bit of mud in here, so it would have been a bit deeper originally. So that's that sediment. Yeah. Yeah. But then more water's coming in, slowly rising, and then bingo. Start catching some fish. And this is the start. Yeah. The mob would have been waiting. Floodwaters are coming in. The eels are hitting the wall there, trying to find a way through. There's the way through. And the eels are going in here. And then the mob would have grabbed the basket once it was full and pulled it up. OK? And emptied it out on the, uh, on the open out there, because the water wouldn't be right up that far at this particular stage. So this one works while the water is yeah. up to this level, doesn't it? Up Once to, the water starts yep. getting too high, then the fish can just go over the top. They go over the top and go around. Yeah. As the lake continued to rise, even more channels and traps were incorporated into the system. It cleverly exploited the natural flow of the water to greatly extend the availability of the eels. But the whole system also worked in reverse when the floodwaters receded in late spring. The basket's got to go the other way around, eh? Because yeah. the water's now going back out towards the lake proper. I mean, this is now like works like a great funnel, doesn't it? It's all made for different levels of flooding. The Gundich Mara also channeled water and eels into natural depressions that became permanent ponds once the floodwaters receded. In a sense, they become like growing ponds, making more eels available by creating these extra habitats for them. And there lies the, the basis of aquaculture. And then when you want them... They just be them. Yeah. Any time of the year. So it's not just fish traps to actually capture these creatures, it's also growing them as well, so that they're all year. And like I say, this, this flies in the face of, I guess, these sort of traditional views that Europeans have, that Aboriginal people were just simple hunter-gatherers living off the land. Aboriginal people, at least in this area, are not your basic hunter-gatherers. You're, you're real farmers. The Gundich Mara weren't just cultivating eels. They were making permanent stone houses clustered together in villages. So your front door through here. So we've got one here. Yep. And oh, we've got a neighbourhood here. There's another one here. You can see the outline. See, they're all facing the same way. Yes, they are. There's the wall around, coming around. The walls aren't very high at all. So they might only be 60 centimetres or so. It's really just enough to hold uh, the posts up because you can't get the post into the ground when you hit bedrock. 
you probably have at least five arching branches coming up to a good two metres at least, to a sort of point. Then you sort of cover it with branches and leaves, etc., to, to seal it. And you're only talking about one section of this village. The village is thousands and thousands of Gunditjmara peoples spread right throughout here. And similar stone huts like this are situated all over the place. We know the Gunditjmara numbered at least three to 4,000 people with population densities that uh, were some of the highest in, this, in, in Australia. What I like about these houses is you can actually sit in a place where one of your ancestors sat. Absolutely. Who would we mm. see? Mm. You would have smelt the fire smoke. You would have heard language echoing through the bushes. Kids playing throughout the stones. The young girls will be discussing the young males that were walking around strutting their stuff. Um, and whispering their names, so who was available and who wasn't. The men coming back from hunting, singing out before they got close to the camp, and then the, the women singing back to them. What great knowledge that they must have had at that particular time. that's that cultural, spiritual footprint that is still here on this country and so very, very, very much alive. And it's very, very much alive around the whole of Australia. Just think of the knowledge. It would be phenomenal. You just get these huge lists of plants and animals. And then there's all the medicines that people had. It's just hundreds and hundreds of different species where people know the virtues of every single one. In many parts of the world, we know that uh, the people moved into domesticating plants and animals. And when you start doing that, there's much more food in the environment compared to, say, your average hunter-gatherer society. But with Aboriginal people in this continent, something very different was happening where, in a sense, people weren't so much domesticating animals, they are actually domesticating the entire landscape. There was one major tool for domesticating the landscape that was used all around Australia. Fire. Its use here was far more ambitious and productive than anywhere else in the world. That's how would we do it that all people they use it um, for burning? Show me like how to do it and how how they were hunting. Sean Narmanyik and his crew in Arnhem Land burn parts of their country almost every day when the dry season starts. Our culture, many people, they use for everything. Burning, like we use for that hunting, we use the ceremony, song line, everything. For roads, like for somewhere else, for other station, like busy lot of other people, good. It's really good. Beautiful. But too dangerous. And stay in there. That fire is going to go fast. You burn. You're going to stay there from there. You're right. You're safe. The most immediate way that fire was used was as a tool for hunting. All people like this, just run around in the ground. Same like this, running a little bit, 100 meters, something like that. And then they say all people like they shot ma. Do it burning from there. Or stay there, wait. Burn, burn, burn. That fire gonna go fast. The kangaroo. We have to wait that kangaroo coming. Fire coming quick. 
So the way here, it's, it doesn't look us, and then this kangaroo is running from here. Bang, gone. And I don't just run, run everybody, else. just kangaroo, they just jump on everywhere. So that's why we're going to use the kick. In many parts of remote Australia, the wisdom of Aboriginal fire management with its regular and selective burning has recently been adopted by the authorities. Not every time we're burning here, every place, you know, like flower country, bush, everywhere. You know, explain all, all people, they know everything, everything. of Australia was patterned to suit the animals, the plants, and therefore the people. The use of fire was so widespread and systematic that it transformed the entire landscape of Australia, including this early European view of Mount Eccles in Victoria. We're actually on these rocks here. This is now a lookout, and it was then. Then, over on the left, high up, there's a very distinctive cliff face. And there it is, a boomerang-shaped cliff face over there below that hill. Early European accounts and paintings show that all over Australia, Fire was used as a sophisticated tool to create the right resources in the right places. There's a lane of grass going all the way down to the water. There's another lane that goes in here and then very narrowly goes along there and another lane there and lanes on the other side of grass. This is a typical Aboriginal pattern for hunting kangaroos. What they would do is very carefully burn this grassland, burn it clear of forest. You do that by burning the saplings and the seedlings when they're young. That converts the eucalypt country to grass. Then they let the grass grow. When it's time to hunt, they'd light a small patch, wait a fortnight or so until that patch was young, green grass. So that regrowth of grass is what uh, kangaroos would head for. And of course, that meant the hunters are going to trap them against the water. This is a lure with fresh grass and then a trap. Look how many lanes there are. Even in Von Gerard's painting, we can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Now look what's happened. No grass lanes, trees scattered all over the place, uh, a very dense forest, an uneven forest. I remember one lady saying, poor country, gone wild now. They would like it clean, tidy, neat, in patterns so that it could uh, catch kangaroos and also feed kangaroos, of course, because they knew where the animals would be. In other words, the animals were much more predictable. Abundant, convenient, predictable. The three purposes of Aboriginal fire. To clear a uh, eucalypt forest and make it grass, you have to burn for the length of a eucalypt. So we're talking perhaps 400 years, possibly much more. To move grass into a particular old growth rainforest, which might be up to 900 years, suggests that Aboriginal people were maintaining those patterns for at least that long. Those patterns with different vegetation occur all over Australia. Tasmania, Northern Territory, Western Australia, Cape York. 
every habitat in Australia was skillfully burned over thousands of years. It meant that the entire continent could produce more reliable food, even in the harshest places. Then I gotta go down there. When you're ready. As a ranger in the Western Desert, Timmy Patterson is always lighting fires. <laughs> Did you burn this one, Timmy? No, no, yeah, last year. Last year. Good season time. By regularly burning small patches, even the slow growing deserts can be continually productive. That is dingy with it, gooseberry. This for people to eat when they come hunting, you know? Turkey, bush turkey, banana. We light a fire, they come and look for lizards. Like, they might come behind later on after the fire. The entire landscape is burned in a deliberate mosaic pattern so that different stages of regrowth offer a variety of food throughout the year. That's what they in the ecological terms, the law was the same all over Australia, and that is keep animals abundant, convenient and predictable. So you can imagine that with all people responsible for every conceivable form of life, uh, collectively, there's a responsibility for every part of the ecology of the environment. What it did was enable people not to depend on chance, but on policy. And the result is that in that enormous complexity of plants, animals, birds, insects and reptiles, they are weaving a way through to balance them all. They did all that. In a sense, you set it up so that the plants and animals look after themselves. You do the initial investment, and then the plants and animals do the rest. It's, it's a clever way of, of doing it. It leaves more time to do other things in life. Aboriginal people have uh, created this, this continent that really is quite different to any other place in the world. And this is one of the, the great chapters of, of human history, is what's happening here. leading up to European contact, this continent was occupied corner to corner with over 200 nations and cultures. All 
were actively manipulating every ecological niche within the cycles of nature to create a land management system that spanned the entire continent. It was the biggest estate on Earth. What they did was remarkable. No other uh, world civilization achieved it. They were ensuring that all species had a habitat. People could use those resources, plants and animals, and sustain their society, keep its resultant and unchanging uh, without risk to their future until the completely unexpected, the arrival of outsiders. My ancestors seen this strange thing floated in, 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 in a, invading the coast. The first major contact with outsiders took place about 400 years ago, when Macassans from Indonesia arrived in fishing prows. They brought in implements, you know, like axe, machete, um, knife. Once that communication ha have been established, that you sort of just whoo, spread it at all. You know, they're friendly. Over time, this became a major international trade with hundreds of boats arriving each season. Sea cucumbers were caught and sold to China, where they were a delicacy. Lines of fireplaces processed the sea cucumbers or tripang along the beach. But three, four, five, six, seven, eight, yeah, and it just keeps going. But if there was what, eight, nine, ten lines here? Yeah. And two, they, 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 at least two four. pots on each one, there's 20. If three pots, there's 30. The more lines over there. Yeah. That's a lot of tree ping that they were gathering. Yeah. Ronald's ancestors helped process the sea cucumbers in exchange for exotic items, dug out canoes with sails and detachable harpoons. Tobacco pipes and beautiful fabrics. The Macassans came regularly over hundreds of years, but didn't try to settle permanently. Conflict was rare. People even traveled with the fishermen back to Macassar. In 1606, in Wick country, new strangers came. The Dutch, like white ghosts from across the seas. The story of this very first European contact was passed down from generation to generation. From my grandfather, but his great grandfather must have been telling him, you know. That man in this town, they came to this place. You Unga, they anchored not very far from the river, but in the middle. Dutchman in this town, 
Oké, ik ga net dit mamen. Pet. Dat is goed, hè? En aardem. En die water, water. En dan blijkt wel eens wat je me. Water, water. These are the ghosts. They came out from the grave. In 1606, the Dutch East India Company sent Captain Wilhelm Jan Zoon to explore the Southern Ocean for trade and gold. It was company policy to kidnap people to be interpreters and to show them where the gold was. That that man will grab that young girl, see? If you never grab that young girl, that would have been no trouble. Kill him. Kill that fellow. I kill this fellow here. Killed about three or four of them. Some of them ran away. And they all went back. Went down and they rode back to the boat. The way they went, they fired, burn, burn, burn. Never came back. This was the first encounter between Aboriginal people and Europeans. And Dutch logs confirmed it left dead on both sides. Nothing of value for trade, only a dry, infertile coast without fresh water, inhabited by uncivilized people. No gold, only sand. For the next 200 years, Dutch ships were seen off the north, west, and south of the continent. Then, on the east coast, a ship from a different nation appeared. Something that you've never ever seen before. But this was real. Aboriginal people were standing there watching this and watching every move that these fellows made and wanted to find out what they wanted. Who are they? Both Banks and Cook record that they were almost ignored when the boat first sailed into Botany Bay. And yet when they actually then tried to land, um, a man and a younger man actually threw spears at them. It wouldn't have been about fear. These fellows wouldn't have been worried about it. It would have been curiosity. What are they here? What are they doing? I think that would have been an extraordinary moment, really, when these two guys suddenly realised that, in fact, it was them against this boat, which was full of people that had things that made noises. Once they started discharging their weapons, then I think you would have had a fear factor. Well, hang on, what the bloody hell is this? The two Eora warriors stood their ground and threatened with their spears. Another shot wounded the older man. The white strangers landed. Both warriors threw their spears. A third shot, and the men ran away. In six days in Botany Bay, this was the only direct contact between the Eora and the strangers.
18 years later, 11 ships with over a thousand people on board sailed into the heartland of the Garigal people. This time, they stayed. I'd like to acknowledge our Aboriginal elders, past and present, and pay my respects. And to all our Aboriginal brothers and sisters, from whatever Aboriginal nation you may have come from, welcome to Gadigal land, Aboriginal land. And to all our non-Indigenous brothers and sisters, a very warm and sincere welcome to you. was, is, and always will be Aboriginal land. A lot of spiritual issues that are still on this land here, and they are alive. In our culture, we feel our ancestors are here. When I feel it, I start to cry. That they say to me, welcome home, Margaret. You can pre-order the entire First Footprint series on DVD from your local ABC shop. Next week, the Iraq War. Get the inside story of one of the biggest mistakes the United States government and its allies have ever made.